Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the forum. Today, we have, well, we have three district races that we're going to be taking a look at. We'll be taking a look at them in just a moment. But please, one of the things that the forum is proud of is its long history. And we're looking forward to, continu to continuing that history and looking at having more younger people join us. Don't misunderstand those of you that are over 114 sitting here right now, you're valued as well. But we're looking very seriously at a youth movement, and today we have a potential intern with us. I'd like you all to welcome Carter Cruz, the president of Tigard High, with a marvelous political ambition, and he's starting that, out of the school system, he's starting that political ambition today. Carter. We'd like to welcome you, thank you very much. Today, we're looking at three races. We're looking at House District 24, House District 37, and Senate District 17. We'd like to start off with House District 24 with Representative Jim Wheatner and Challenger Ken Moore. We threw a t coin toss this uh, earlier, and Rep Challenger Ken Moore will go first. Each candidate will have six minutes to talk, and there'll be an opportunity for a two-minute rebuttal and then we'll be open for questions. Questions should be kept short, and answers should be kept to a maximum of a minute, minute and a half, if at all possible. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and if I may welcome Ken Moore. Well, it's great to be here at the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I am grateful for this opportunity and um, always amazed at the energy of Eric Squires, who puts this together. Thank you. And uh, he's a man of many hats, and I wish him well in his race. I'd like to uh, just give you a, a brief introduction about me, my background. Um, 35 years ago, I uh, cleared some space in the woods and uh, used the lumber from those trees to build my house with my own hands. We raised three children in that house. They all graduated from Yamhill Carleton High School, and um, it's been a great life here. I started out working for Intel at um, Hawthorne Farms, and uh, we produced single board computers there, and it was a great experience. I uh, also worked for Hewlett Packard in McMinnville, so I've had uh, experience throughout the district. I spent many years, a few years farming alfalfa and oats. So I have uh, some experience with agriculture. I think that'll serve me well. Uh, but I turned that farm over to uh, more professional farmers. But I went away with some good experience. After um, working and getting my family started, I felt that call to serve in my community and uh, found a home for many years as president of Gallery Theater in McMinnville, where we um, put on quality entertainment year after year on a shoestring budget. It was a great community experience. It, currently, I'm a small business owner. I am a licensed, bonded, insured contractor, and uh, I work as a handyman. The tagline in the uh, yellow pages is, call me, I can fix it. So I have had experience with manufacturing in a large business and also experience in small business. Both these experiences will be uh, valuable to me in representing this, this district. I also have served in my church as president of the board. I've served in the schools where I served as an Aspire counselor. Anybody familiar with what Aspire does? They help counsel kids that are making that transition from high school to college or vocational school with all those forms and applications and um, Sometimes parents aren't equipped to do that, they're overwhelmed, and school counselors are overwhelmed with help, helping the kids get through high school. So adults from the community were able to step in and serve in the high schools, and I was one of those. I have a special spot in my heart for kids with learning disabilities, and I was able to bring a program to uh, many of the schools in McMinnville and Hillsboro that serves um, motivating kids with special needs. So, now, as I am in semi-retirement, um, I have the energy and the, and the calling to run for this office. I want to serve the people of my district. 
I've heard them on the doorsteps. They've been open with me about their concerns about education, living wage jobs, senior issues, veterans issues. People also often ask me, why are you running? Well, I think I've given you a little bit of background, but also we need in this district better representation. The current representative has had a hard time showing up, and he has said that his business is overwhelming, the pay is too low to support him, and so he has missed um, over a third of the days in the last session, in the 2014 session, he was not there, resulting in uh, missing nearly a third of the votes. And when challenged on that, he gave a reason that his son was sick. I looked at the reasons that he wrote for not being in the legislature for those over a third of the days of the last legislative session, and a sick child was not in those excuses. I have no doubt that his child was sick, but that has not been reconciled. Um, the session before, he missed over, he missed 20, over almost 20 percent of his committee meetings. And um, when responding to this, he says, it really doesn't matter that I'm not at those meetings. It doesn't matter that I missed those votes. So I have a different attitude about my ability to represent this district by being available at every committee meeting for every vote to be the voice of our district. One thing that got me off my political couch was the Citizens United decision that corporations are people and money is speech. I was very disturbed about the increasing trend of money in, in influencing politics. I did not expect to find that influence right here in our own district. Jim has accepted over a half a million dollars from large corporations and PACs. When he had a chance to vote for a bill that would save Cover Oregon and taxpayers money, but it would cut into the profits of the large insurance companies that support him, he voted no. There's a conflict of interest when corporate money is accepted and doors are opened because you have paid for access. I pledge that I will not accept corporate money, and if I do, it will be then immediately given to a nonprofit in my district. So I welcome, is this time for questions? Not yet, okay. Well, I want to just finish with my passion to serve. I would be honored to serve, honored to represent the constituents in House District 24. Two quick reminders, six minutes max per, uh, per speech and then two minutes afterwards to rebut. When we move to questions, only forum members are allowed to ask those questions. Now, if I may, Representative Widener, please. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for having us here today. Uh, it's not too often that we get to come out to this side of the district. It actually goes to River Road. Uh, it doesn't actually come over quite this far, but I drive through here all the time because uh, one of the companies that I do design and development for with condition monitoring equipment is right over here on Allen Boulevard. So from Yam Hill, I shoot over the hill right past here every day on Farmington Road as I uh, go in there to see them. I shouldn't say every day. It's about one day a week that I... Uh, make the trek across here, either that or I'll come across the other way. But it's a pleasure to be with you here today, uh, to share insights where I'm at on different issues and everything, and uh, give you a chance to know me on this side of the district. Uh, some of you here in the room have worked with me before on different issues, and uh, I'd just like to go over everything and address everything that uh, has been raised. First of all, I want to address some of the comments that Ken made about me and my time. Unfortunately, he doesn't want to talk about issues with me because he's on the opposite side of the issues and uh, he knows that's not what our district represents and wants in those issues. So uh, he's been going to voting record. I have a 93% voting attendance since I have been in office. I was elected in 2008 
have served honorably for the entire time, have worked with colleagues across the aisle. The February session, yes, there was time that I missed because my son was sick in January. We thought he had cystic fibrosis. We were with teams of doctors and everything else. I did say excuse for business because I'd missed time for business that I was having to make up at the end, but I still was able to co-sponsor eight pieces of legislation that went through and passed during the one month session. Most of your work begins on bills before you ever go in. I have lots of bills that are already drafted that uh, we will get moving on very quickly so we can get them across the floor and get them passed. But to give you an idea of what happens when those bills get to the floor in the February session, some of the ones I've missed were House Bill 2008, which the vote on that was 59 to 0, to House Bill 4009, 58 to 0, 4010, 57 to 0. 4018, 55 0, 4020, 54 to 1, House Bill 2022, 51 to 0. So that gives you an idea of what goes on in the February session. It's mainly we're taking care of budget issues and things like that. So, so there was a period of time where we had a bunch of snow. I was gone for business for three days, making up for time that was lost in January. Then actually into May, I had a bunch of time off where we were actually at OHSU visiting a bunch of specialists and things like that. Because when your youngest son, you find out that there's a chance that he may have cystic fibrosis, it's probably one of the scariest things I've ever faced, knowing that your child has a death sentence. So that's what went on during the time. Committees, I'm there most all the time for those, but when you, as my constituent, show up in my office, I will spend the time with you and put everybody else aside, and we will talk, because you took the time to come down to Salem. I'm going to take the time for you when you're there in the building. You can ask any of the constituents that we've worked with in the district that have ever had an issue, and I had a very heartwarming, actually it was almost overwhelming for me yesterday when I was out uh, knocking on doors, talking to voters. Uh, one of the doors I came to, the guy just kind of creeped through the door and he looked and he just kept saying, what's your name again? And I said, Jim Widener. And he's like, do you remember me? And I'm like, well, I'm not sure. He goes, I had congenitive heart failure and you saved my life. And I'm like, Okay, tell me a little more. What's your name? And he goes, and he says, Jerry. And I said, you were one of our very first constituent cases that we had, wasn't it, Jerry? And he goes, you had it was in 2009, 2010, when it took, came on, and I remember my staff bringing it to me. And we weren't sure if he was someone that was just trying to get on disability or what, because that was an avenue we went. We actually helped get him on Social Security. He was back on doctor bills. We were able to get him taken care of and reconciled in the district to where his bills were paid for when he was $30,000 in debt, or majority of them, to where he was able to sustain his house, and he's still alive today when they had only given him a little bit of time left. And he goes, I'm alive today because of you. And it just about brought me to tears. I went and actually grabbed Jameson, who worked for me forever, and uh, took him back there, and we spent a lot of time with him, and he said he would do anything to help us out, and this has happened with different issues in the district over and over. When you come to us, we're going to help you. Right now we have Leonard DeWitt, a World War II hero that we found here in our district that should have received the Congressional Medal of Honor. We've went out and raised the money to build a statue for him to get it, him recognized for what he did in World War II. He's 92 years old. And December 7th, we're gonna unveil that statue and we're having an event for that to help him. And we will do those sort of things when we find constituents that need help. I am proud to say our office is one of the hardest working offices in the building. We do not turn anybody away. We don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, we're going to help you. But I'm proud to be here and I'm proud that corporations are helping me. Some of those are Schnitzer Steel who employs people right into the district, one of our largest employers, Nike, Intel. These are companies that actually do get behind and help me because I understand business needs. I own a business in the district. I own a lens manufacturing facility that we just opened up. We also was in the restaurant business and uh, that was probably one of the things I'll tell you if you have a large fortune, you want to make it a small fortune, open a restaurant. So with that, I'm willing to take questions as we go on. but. Uh, I thank you for having me here today and uh, enjoy spending time with you. Thank you.
Well, it'll take me more than two minutes to rebut that, but I'll give it my best shot. You notice that when Jim mentioned those votes that were 58 to 0, there were 58 other people there. If they all had the attitude, well, it doesn't matter if I show up, we would have an empty legislature. Um, Jim mentioned a few of the votes, but he missed 52 votes. Okay, that's a lot. He didn't talk about some of the other bills that he missed, for example, for career technical education. He was absent for that vote. Um, he was there to vote no on early learning, a particular passion of mine being about education. I am the education candidate. That's one of the reasons I am running. He um, voted no against the small business office, and I was there to see that report about how this office that has been created clears the path for small businesses and the problems that they're having. So yes, we are on the opposite side of many issues. I, I agree to that. Um, Jim sits on the health care committee. Um, he, 95 percent of his donations are from PACs and large corporations. And on the health care committee, one of his major contributors is Squibb and also Johnson & Johnson, multinational corporations, whose one of their purposes is to funnel money from our district, since they have no stake here, into the uh, portfolios of their stockholders. He is funded by a geography and an economy that is not ours. So I don't want to go more into the excuses, but those excuses fell outside of the legislative session February to March, if you were following those dates. Yeah. That, that concludes my rebuttal. I'm ready for questions. You have, enough, you have your two minutes, too, don't you? Uh, how many people in here have a retirement program, some sort of 401k or anything like that? A lot of you. Guess what? You may be invested in Johnson & Johnson, Bristol-Myers Squibb. You may be invested in these companies, so everybody in this room has a financial interest in these corporations that they're successful because our retirement's in them. I have money invested in energy. I have it in medical. That's where my retirement is. We need these companies to be successful. We're a state that's driven off income tax. We need to support Intel. We need to support Nike. We need to support Schnitzer. We need to give them the tools that they need to expand and grow. Companies like Weyerhaeuser, they provide a lot of jobs here in the state of Oregon. If we were to treat them like second-class citizens and say, hey, you're not welcome here, that hurts every small business, every medium-sized business in this state. We have to support them because the companies that I do business with, I'm a small business right here, design and develop, manufacture electronic equipment. It's warehouser company that buys them. It's GP. It's Schnitzer. We sell equipment to them. If they're gone, we're not here. A lot, it's sad, but a lot of the business that I have to do is outside of the state because the oil and gas industry is one of the biggest markets for us right now where we sell equipment to. We need to incentivize companies to be here because they employ people, people basically receive income, and that income goes into taxes, which creates revenue for the state. Uh, education, my mom was a teacher forever. My wife works, had worked for the ESD forever. Now she's working for Head Start for early childhood development. She's always worked with autistic children. Uh, no one can say that I don't care about kids or care about education because education is very important to me because I've grown up in a house full of educators. So with that, I am done. Thank you. I'm John Tyner. I thank Rob for um, filling up, filling in quite ably. Okay, questions for former members only limited to 30 seconds, not more than a minute. One subject. The reply should be brief because we have more people coming on. I see Karen Packer approaching the um, microphone. She'll do the duty in the usual way. She'll identify herself as a former member. She'll enter her name and direct whom the question is, at, is directed. I'm Karen Packer, former member. Um, thank you both for coming today. Uh, I would like to ask the candidates, particularly Mr. Widener, um, what, what your role was in the Cover Oregon oversight um, business, as we've seen that unravel, and I'd also like to say that I am a constituent of yours. So, 
Well, Karen, I appreciate the question. Uh, I actually was on the health care when uh, Cover Oregon was being rolled out, and it started with Senate Bill 99, and uh, I spent a lot of time actually with Rocky King in my office and uh, was very adamant when we were going through the process that we develop a business plan because there was no direction when this was being developed. We didn't know what the money was going to be used for. And it was $54 million when it originally started, Karen. And this eventually ballooned up into $284 million. But they came up with a business plan that showed that it wasn't going to work as well when you looked at that business plan. And I vocally stood up on the floor, talked about the Medicaid expansion, how you, we could buy a great software company when it was at $54 million. And they still went ahead with the project and ignored all the signs of failure on it. So I was, as your representative, the, one of the few no votes on it. I got other people to vote no on Senate Bill 99 when it left the House, but uh, there was no way it was going to work because there wasn't the oversight and direction involved in it when we uh, ran that across the floor. And unfortunately, we did it in a one-month session, and a bill like that should have never been addressed in that short of session because it didn't give you, the people, a chance to come down and say, hey, have you thought of this or thought of that? It was something that was rushed through very, very carelessly, and we should have addressed it much better than what we did, and it should have been carried over to the next long-term session. And unfortunately, Oregon became an embarrassment because of Cover Oregon across the nation. Yes, Jim was on the health care committee and missed 25 percent of those meetings in 2013 when Cover Oregon was being discussed. Um, the, I mentioned the, uh, the bill before where he could have um, voted against, voted for money that would, uh, a bill that would have saved taxpayers and Cover Oregon money, but would have cut into the profits of the people that fund him. That was House Bill uh, 2118. And I'd like to say these corporations that I'm naming are not, I certainly am, love these corporations and what they do in our area, but to be bought by them is not good for a legislator. That was, that's the point I was making. As far as Cover Oregon, um, the, a bill didn't, uh, Jim didn't show up to uh, protect the small businesses uh, being hurt by, by Cover Oregon in uh, House Bill 4154. Um, when the Senate wanted to um, make Cover Oregon follow the existing state rules, Jim was not there to vote for uh, House Bill 4122B. So these are some of, the, some of the legislation that he missed that was part of his responsibility to protect us, and he failed to do that. Um, the Cover Oregon was outsourced to a company of which they no longer had oversight, and Jim was in on the committee that did that, and he failed us by protecting us from that. John Blackman, forum member. Uh, this is addressed to each of you. Uh, let's talk the vehicle registration fee. At present in the state of Oregon, the semi-annual vehicle registration fee is flat. Washington County wants to add another flat vehicle registration fee. There is a state to the south of us that bases the vehicle registration fee on the manufacturer's suggested retail price when new which decreases every year. Would you comment on that, please? The state to the south that uh, bases their registration fee on the purchase price of the vehicle um, I don't think that's as good a connection as to miles traveled and what we do that with now is a gas tax. Um, I think that is an effective way, although that is failing us now as uh, we have more and more electric vehicles. So they aren't taxed um, by a gas tax to pay for our roads. So that And those fees would go towards our infrastructure. 
So we have a flat vehicle registration fee at this time. Correct. Raising taxes is something that we have to do very carefully. I see that there's a fairness issue here, and I would like to be in on that conversation uh, with you. Um, but as far as deciding right now in front of you that I'm for raising taxes, I'm going to wait till I hear more about that possibility. I understood your question, so I sat on transportation and dealt with this issue. Uh, and it is an issue that uh, does concern me a little bit. I think it's uh, tough to actually put it to where on the value of the car, but if we did it with a time period as it went on with the age of the car, that's something I probably would support because I was essentially against raising the registration fees when we had basically in 2009, we uh, tripled, doubled and tripled registration fees on automobiles and individuals while we raised the gas tax. I didn't, the gas tax wasn't that bad, it was six cents a gallon, but doubling and tripling registration fees, that hurts people. That hurts people in my community when the average income per household is $52,000. That's something that we can't do because now you have a family asked to decide, do I send my kid, can he play sports? Can I pay for that registration or do I re-register my car? So as the car gets older, I think it's something we really should look at is taking that where it reduces the registration fees. So the first time is at that upper level, yeah. then the next time knock off $20 and then so on as it goes down with age. So I would support doing something like that because I know individuals are being hurt. Uh, if you're in an older car, you really shouldn't be paying that higher registration fee um, because sometimes the registration costs more than what the car is worth. And that's an issue. So yes, I would look into that and look at lowering registration fees for older vehicles. Chris Leslie, for member, this question is for both of you. What is your position and why on the marijuana measure? I am no on the marijuana measure. Uh, I'm no on most of the measures that are up there. Uh, to me, I'm working actually on just dealing with the medical marijuana because right now we have too many people that are getting marijuana cards and they're not doing it for medical reasons. I know 18-year-old kids that have medical marijuana cards and it's a card for life. It should be just like a prescription where once they issue that card, it should be good for six months. And then you go back and see your doctor so your doctor can talk to you, is it working or not? But I do not support legalizing marijuana because I've heard too many stories from friends of mine that are firefighters that have went to crash scenes. They open it up and you can smell marijuana coming out of the card, car. They're 18 year old kids and they have medical marijuana cards. So we're dispensing cards too easily uh, I don't want to see us get in the business of basically opening up marijuana for everybody because I think it hurts the state and it hurts individuals. Well, Jim and I, Jim and I are going to agree. Um, I'm voting no on this, on this measure. Um, that's a personal vote. Um, I think marijuana, though, is coming, and we do need to prepare for it. And some of the concerns I have is that the science is not in on how uh, driving under the influence of intoxicants can be determined um, for marijuana. The science is in on how it does affect young minds and a young up to the age of the late 20s of how a brain develops. This concerns me a lot. I think we need more time to see what's going to happen in Colorado and Washington before we can draft a measure that will be effective assuming that it's coming. It won't if it follows my vote. Gentlemen, on behalf of the forum, thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Sorry I wasn't here on time. I was stuck in traffic on I-5. Thank you. Um, Mr. Rosenthal, are you here? Garrett. Um, basically, I'd like you to do, do a buck of five-minute remarks. Ms. Parrish is not here. Is that correct? Yeah. We'll do five minutes remarks, probably limit questions, because we've got to get the next folks on. As usual, the first person always takes most of the one-third time. So give your remarks and we'll bring them up next. Well, the nice thing is the rebuttal is going to be really easy. 
And I also want to, again, give thanks to uh, Eric for uh, being able to put this on and run a campaign and do all sorts of things. And I'm uh, pleased to be here and to be with the forum. I haven't been here for a few years, so it's, I'm glad to be here. I, does that sound all right for you, everybody? Uh, first of all, who am I? My name is Garrett Rosenthal. I'm running House District 37. Uh, I've been uh, living in this district for 23 years. I've lived in Oregon since about 1965, went to school here. I've worked and lived in Eugene a lot. I also lived in uh, the Portland area, and I've lived around the Northwest. I'm an environmental consultant. I've been an environmental consultant in the Northwest for about 45 years both with my own company as well as working for other companies. I've managed large offices and small offices. I've done work with public service as well as with private companies. So I worked a lot with private companies. I know their perspective and I know also their problems with, with regulations and I know the public sector and what it's trying to accomplish. Uh, so before I go a little further, I want to, if you don't know the district, the district is sort of interesting and quite varied. It, in, it includes Tualatin and West Lynn and then Stafford and then it includes River Grove, which some have said is the most educated city in, Portland, in, in Oregon. It's, of course, there's only 500 people, so it's easy. And then Durham, a little bit of uh, King City, and also the area in Lake Oswego around Merrillhurst. So it includes quite an interesting diversity that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, the reason that you may want to wonder why I'm running, I ran four years ago. And as I told one week, I filed twice earlier than that, but when there was a viable candidate, I basically suspended the campaign. That was back oh, 10 years ago. So I ran four years ago, didn't win the primary. I'm running again because there was no challenger showing up for uh, the current incumbent, Julie Parrish. And I said, well, I've been active in politics. I was I'm chair of the uh, platform committee for the, Washington, for the Washington County Democrats as well as for the Democratic Party of Oregon. And I said, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the state issues, the state policies, the state concerns. I'm familiar with my district. I've lived there for 23 years. I think it's appropriate that I should file and that I should run a campaign and present a significant alternative. Now, having the advantage of being on the platform committee, I'm familiar with both the Democratic and the Republican platforms, and there really are substantive differences. And I said it's not appropriate in this district, which is a swing district, and it's about one-third each, non-aligned uh, Republican and Democrats, it's not appropriate not to have a choice in this district. So I was a little disappointed that nobody had found somebody else to, to uh, campaign, so I took it on. I couldn't start until after the uh, platform convention. Now, I just want to say something that's sort of humorous. So, well, Lamont, we credit me with writing, virtually writing the, the Democratic Party platform, and that is not correct. I can claim credit for being a good cat herder, however, because if you have ever done anything like that, you realize that you're dealing with a lot of disparate opinions and a lot of people with strong opinions. And so I, I think we came up with something good, but I, I, all I can do is claim that I was responsible for bringing them together and coming up with common ideas. Uh, so Willamette Week uh, had a very strange take on that. That's all I can say. Uh, the big issues, and, and I'm running because there are significant issues in the district, and I want to point them out. Of course, always the, district, the, the issues are education, the economy, and the environment. But these spin quite a bit differently. For example, the issue about jobs is probably not a tremendous concern in West Lynn. I mean, everybody's concerned about jobs, but... Westland and Tualatin have two of the best school districts in the state. Most of these students there are going to have better access to jobs than people in most of the rest of the state, and they live in the metropolitan region. So their, their issue is keeping education strong and trying to encourage education throughout the rest of the area, through the rest of the state, because you can't run a state on just two, two or three or four or five good educational districts. So that's an issue that I'm concerned about, particularly education. I have been a teacher, so I'm pretty... I wouldn't say I'm an expert in education. Uh, one of the things is working with the educational caucus. You realize how many different opinions. If you talk to administrators or teachers or parents or um, just people who, who are concerned about education in general, you realize there's very different perspectives and very different approaches. I should have mentioned the educational professionals. So I have been a teacher. I'm concerned about education. But like I said, we have two strong districts. And so their concern is not the same as it is in Portland, not the same as it is in Eugene or the rural areas. We need more support for the rural areas. That's particularly important. Uh, the environment, of course, they have a nicer environment than many places do, fewer industries, and sort of a better quality of life, you might say. But still, environment and toxics is a big issue. Having been a toxic, not a toxicologist, but a person involved in toxics throughout my life, environmental management, 
this is an issue that I can address very clearly. Uh, finally, uh, the econ I think I mentioned the economy, but I would want to mention a couple other things that are very important in the district are land use planning. Stafford, in case you haven't driven through it, is a beautiful area. There's a big controversy over the urban growth areas, the rural reserve, the urban reserves, excuse me, and the, ur and the rural uh, reserves, and the, the future of Stafford. This is one of the things that motivates a lot of people in and around my area. Less so, but also still important in West Lynn and Tualatin. So I think I'll shorten it up and just say I'm running because of significant issues in the district. I'm running because there was a substantial difference in policy and approach between myself and Ms. Parrish. And uh, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We're in a kind of a little bit of time squeeze here. Um, is uh, John Verbeck here? Would you come on up here? And uh, Senator Elizabeth Steiner Hayward? Come on up. We're going to, um, if you'd like to sit up here, we can do that. The 6-2-2 six, six, two, two format would be there. The interesting thing about this is that we can take questions after the television show ends. So I will have the incumbent um, present first, and you've got your six minutes. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Apologize. It's okay. It's tight space. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for taking the time to engage in this way. Um, this is really what makes a difference in elections is an informed electorate, and you all taking the time to come to something like this demonstrates your commitment to being active, engaged citizens, and I really appreciate that. Regardless of party affiliation, regardless of ideas, we all do better when we meet the candidates, when we get better educated about the issues and where people stand. I've had the privilege of meeting many of you over the past three years that I've been the incumbent in this office. Some of you I'm just seeing for the first time today. And I have to say that it's been an extraordinary privilege to serve as the senator for District 17 um, during this period of time. And I honestly can't think of a better job in the entire world. Um, I have the opportunity to serve a community in a state that I care about extraordinarily deeply and to continue to learn new things, make connections between disparate ideas. Um, as a systems person, I think most of you know, I'm a family physician by training. I'm still on faculty at OHSU. I still see patients two or three half days a week um, and teach residents and medical students um, to help prepare the next generation of healthcare providers and professionals in Oregon. Um, and the combination of these two jobs really feed my soul in a way that I can't really imagine anything else. When you have an opportunity to teach, to care directly for patients, and then to think about the policies that are going to make Oregon even better than the great state it already is, that's pretty cool, right? Um, and why did I become a legislator? People ask me that all the time. I mean, I had a great job, right? I was full-time faculty at OHSU. I loved what I was doing there. Uh, and um, why did I do this? Well, I'd been involved in advocacy um, through organized medicine since I was a medical student. I mean, we're talking 25 years now. Uh, no, yeah, 25 plus years. 1989 was the first time I went to a national medical meeting. Um, and for starting in 2002, I ran external and legislative affairs for the Oregon Academy of Family Physicians, and I also served on the Oregon Medical Association's legislative committee. And that meant I started spending a lot of time in Salem, um, both advocating for patients, which is really what the OAFP focuses on, because that's what we care about, and thinking about the rural issues, um, because obviously having an adequate supply of healthcare professionals in rural areas is really important for healthcare. Thinking about things that we could do to ensure access to high quality, affordable care for all Oregonians. And over time, as I got more and more engaged, I realized that if what I really care about is having Oregon be the healthiest state in the nation, then what I have to do is help people understand that that's not about what happens in my doctor's office. And it's not about what happens even in our best hospitals. It's about what happens in our communities when our children are born. Do they have good nutrition? Do their parents have the support that they need to be awesome parents? Are they educated in the right way, starting very, very young? Are we helping parents start to read to their kids when they're tiny babies? Because we know that that helps them get, in, get ready to learn. Do we have fabulous K-12 schools and the opportunity to go on to higher ed or vocational training for all Oregonians? 
how's our transportation and transit infrastructure doing? Can people get to and from their jobs? Can we get the products that we create, the wheat that we grow, to market well? These things all fit together. And we have to have policies that demonstrate that we understand that it's not healthcare over here and education over there and transportation some third place altogether, but in fact, it's a web, it's a matrix, right? And um, that's, as a family doctor, I think about systems. And I thought that bringing that perspective to the legislature could be really helpful. Uh, so I've been doing that for three years now, and it has proved successful. I learned something about myself. I'm a budget geek. I did not know this before I went to the legislature. Um, when you come in three weeks before a legislative session and you've never been in the legislature, the Senate president puts you where he wants to, right? Cool. So my first term in 2012, I ended up on the Education Committee in the Senate, which was great for a policy committee, and I ended up on two Ways and Means subcommittees. And as you probably know, those are joint between the House and the Senate, which is a great way to run the budget, much more sensible. So I served on the Health and Human Services subcommittee, kind of makes sense, I'm a doctor, um, and on the General Government subcommittee, which sounds unsexy and uninteresting, but in fact is sort of the back, funds the backbone of the state. Um, and in the 2013 session, I got moved for policy over to Health and Human Services. Again, no surprise. And I have the privilege of chairing the General Government Subcommittee now and serving on the Full Ways and Means Committee and still sitting on the Health and Human Services Subcommittee. So I'm a little busy during session. I have days where I do nothing but sit in committee all day. Um, but why do I do that? Because it's your taxpayer dollars, right? And I want to be really confident that we're spending your dollars and mine in ways that make sense for the state and that we do evidence-based policy to really help get this state the most bang for its buck. And that's what I've been doing. And there's a long way to go. And I'm excited to keep doing it. The best legislators are the ones who build relationships across the aisle, across the building. And I've been doing that. I've done a lot of bipartisan work. And I'm looking forward to an agenda that's going to stretch out for a while. I want to be here and keep serving for a long time to come. Thank you so much. So great to be able to raise this. Uh, my, thank you for all for coming. Uh, my name is John Frubeek, and uh, I have a financial background. I came to Oregon with my family, an Oregon girl, and two kids uh, 19 years ago. And, uh, uh, my background is primarily in finance. Uh, first uh, in Europe, uh, uh, dealing with big corporations, large bureaucracies, and now, and since I'm in Oregon, retail, dealing with individual people, dealing with decision makers. Uh, I'm running because there was only one name on the ballot uh, in where I live, in Bonnie Slope, and my kids went to uh, Sunset, and uh, two graduates from Sunset High School, and. Uh, I want to get more involved with politics. When I became a U.S. citizen, I didn't like that, uh, that there's only one name on the ballot. So I ran, and once you start looking into, into politics, how it actually works, it, it's very interesting. Uh, many people think, oh, there are 14 Republicans in the, U in the state Senate and 16 Democrats, so you have still an influence. But if you really look into it, you really don't have a seat at the table. You cannot demand clarity or transparency and cover Oregon, uh, for instance. And so that's why I'm running. I want to bring balance to the state Senate so that uh, both parties have uh, equal say and that we can avoid. I cannot guarantee uh, that we will avoid all mistakes, but we can f at least first th uh, th uh, talk things through before we spend so much money on cover Oregon and when we have the opportunity to fix it, that we just don't throw more money at it, but try to fix something if it can be fixed. I think most of the people in this room don't even have an idea how bad Cover Oregon actually is. Uh, my platform is prosperity. I want more people doing more things. Uh, not the government doing it all, but that individual people make life better for others and that we encourage legislation to encourage that. Faith-based organizations, uh, private charities, uh, we, should, we should help them. And, uh, and, uh, so, and, and not just rely on the government. 
we have homeless kids in Oregon, even Sunset High School. Uh, you know, homeless kids, they, they sleep on the couches of friends. It's in the, one of the wealthiest areas of our state. It's, it's really, it's just inexcusable. So uh, what is the exit strategy for, for those kids? You know, they need to have equal access to education and uh, equal opportunity. And that's what I uh, would like in education, that uh, we keep them involved after school activities and uh, even within the school, the programs do not endorse, I don't endorse uh, uh, the national program, and I think of a common core, because it takes away the, 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 the rules of engagement from the teacher. The teacher knows what each kid needs. A child in North Portland has different needs than a child in a Sunset High School. And we have to give the teacher the flexibility to meet those needs. The social background is so different. So Common Core doesn't address that. You have an, a bean counter in DC that determines the success of, your, of the school. So I want to give that money to the teachers, more teachers and to more for the kids, more money for after school activities. So they, there's no idleness. Disappearing in a gang is not an option. Um, the last thing is limited government. I see my role, the role of government, in my opinion, is to protect the weak from the strong. What you see in Cover Oregon is the strong are suing the strong. The government is suing Oracle. And, uh, but what about the individual person, the elderly person, who cannot make any sense of this medical bill they get? It's always wrong and then they get nowhere. They have to make multiple phone calls to the insurance companies, no resolution. And so what is the, the government and the insurance companies are way too close in Cover Oregon. So what you can expect from me is, with balanced in the state senate, that we will uh, hold the insurance companies more accountable and restore the role of government more to protecting the weak against the strong. It's a very big concept, but that's totally missing. Our government in the state of Oregon runs the playbook. They should make the rules, but not have the playbook. And I, in the Oregon, in the Oregonian online voter guide, I, I call for the, the role of government as a zebra, the referee on a football team. It's important that the zebra is distinguishable from the, from the players. And so it's a long road. But if we don't fix that, and it's the same with education, we will not make progress. So I encourage you, especially if you're a Democrat, a lifelong Democrat and are proud of it, I don't expect you to change your voter registration, but think very carefully how you cast your vote this election. It's for the legacy of you and for our state. And uh, my 30 seconds are up, and thank you for coming. John's a little taller than I am. I could stand on my tiptoes or I could try to adjust this. There we go. Um, you know, I'm really glad John's running. And he ran against me in 2012, too. And I do think people deserve a choice. And I also think that we end up with better policies when we bring lots of different perspectives to the table. I could delve into the cover Oregon debacle, but my blood pressure would go through the roof, and we would be here all afternoon, and I'd be hard pressed to limit myself to two minutes. So I'm going to take the liberty of encouraging you to look at the K2 town hall that I participated in and a range of other public forums. Just Google me and cover Oregon, and you'll see a bunch of opportunities to know how I feel about that situation. Um, the other thing I like running about running against John is that he and I have always been very civilized with each other, which I appreciate, um, and really focus on the issues and what each of us brings to the table. We are both committed to the education of our children. We are both committed to having a superb K-12 system in this state. We have slightly different perspectives on how to get there. And I have to say, I'm not an expert in the Common Core, but I think there are pieces of it that are very important because it focuses on the ability to think and the ability to continue to learn rather than knowledge of specific facts, right? The world has changed since I was a child. It's much easier to look up information and it's much harder to problem solve because you have to think about many more aspects of the problem. So what I like about it is that it really encourages 
it looks at kids' ability to problem solve, to think creatively, to be lifelong learners. I'd be happy to talk with you any, more, any of you at any time about my thoughts about the education system, about healthcare transformation, all of which are critical to the future of this state. Thank you so much. I should move it down before I leave. But, uh, and, and I appreciate it's a civilized race. Um, but uh, has the world changed so much? I disagree with that. Uh, in social, in, 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 in human, interhuman behavior, I think we have not made much progress in the last 3,000 years. The only progress really, really made is in technology. But other than that, in, in, in human interaction, I think the progress, uh, we have to be careful not to reinvent the wheel. Um, I think uh, to, uh, you know, both we are both civilized, but there's still contrast between the two of us. On prosperity, uh, I, I support tax breaks for the big corporations, Nike and, Nike and Intel. Uh, where would we be without them in Washington County? But I also support tax breaks for the small businesses. That's a, in contrast with my opponent. We should, uh, we should encourage all businesses to succeed, create jobs, and uh, provide employment. And also um, tie that in with apprenticeships, that young kids, if they're 16 or 17 and they don't have a head for learning, don't want to go to college, that, that, that there are other avenues for them to succeed. And uh, I'm always very impressed what Oregonians can do and make with their hands. Well, thank you again, John Tanner, Forum President. We're going to have the questions now. Questions over as a member of the forum, and we'll want small questions. Succinct. Succinct quick. and quick questions. And Mr. Rosenthal, if you're still here, um, we'll invite you up for questions also. Um, if people haven't directed, again, directed the specific person or to both. Mr. Rosenthal didn't get quarter questions in his portion, so he is here to field whatever you'd like to field. So I'm John McWilliams, forum member. I have a question for, um, uh, for uh, Senator uh, Steiner Haywood. Uh, my question is, um, why is it that you are against uh, raising taxes for, are you for raising taxes for small businesses? Um, that's what I heard that you were. And I wanted to know if you could yeah, that. actually, I, I, I understand John's concern about small business. I actually voted in favor of the small business tax breaks that we passed during the special session in 2013. Because I do think we need to level the playing field and I do think we need to encourage entrepreneurship. Um, Ken Moore brought up the Office of Small Business Assistance. It was actually my subcommittee in Ways and Means that pushed through the funding for that. And I've been working very closely with the Secretary of State's Corporations Division where that runs over the past several months to make sure that that's up and running and that they've got all the resources that they need to um, cut through the red tape. And it's one of the things I've done a lot. I, speaking of the Construction Contractors Board, um, in 2013 I helped pass legislation that created a new path for people who had very limited work, such as locksmiths, and who didn't need to do the entire contractor um, training. So tailoring the licensure to the work that people are doing, streamlining that, and cutting down on the work that people have to do to get up and running in business is one of my highest priorities. Uh, this uh, question is going to be for both of you. Um, for 20 years, I've participated in every uh, Republican platform convention. And uh, I joined the Republican Party long ago because it, it was so connected with what the founders gave us. And remember, the founders were more educated and had more knowledge about history. They were extremely intelligent men, and they gave great thought to our Declaration and the Constitution. So what I want to know is how do you reconcile or how alike your party platform does it hold up to what the founders gave us? in the Democrat Party platform, how does it, how does it um, connect with your party, uh, with the founders? Lois, who are you asking the questions of? I said both of them. Well, we have three of them. 
Well, I'm, well not, I'm not asking you one. I'm asking these two people here. Okay. Well, of course, when America was founded, um, there were no political parties. The political party is, uh, is a creation, invention of America. And in my home country, where, where I immigrated from, the Netherlands, we have, we have many parties, 20 parties. So you can really vote your conscience. But still, there are coalitions of parties. So I think the two-party systems, with all its uh, uh, you know, shortcomings and the, the, the tendency to go to extremes. The Democrat Party have these extreme leftists and the Republican Party is extreme people on the, on the, other, on the other end of the spectrum. Um, it, it still provides stability. And I, I'm not so that measure to abolish that. Uh, I, I would caution us against it. Uh, I just wanted to know how you reconcile your stance with what the founders gave us uh, as a Republican, and uh, for your opponent, a Democrat, how she uh, reconciles the Democrat platform with being a Democrat. Thank you, Lois. I think that you're, uh, you've asked a general question. I think since uh, Mr. Rosenthal was on the platform commission, I'm going to allow him a, few, a little bit to say that, his response to that. So directly to how does the, um, your, uh, your programs relate to the um, framers, it's a very broad question. Answer it any way you want to in less than a minute. And Mr. Rosenthal gets a chance also. Because she was on the Republican uh, committee, he was on the Democratic, there's implied criticism. Let him give him a minute for that. You guys get a minute and we'll have the next question. Well, I'll try and take a minute. First of all, I've compared the, oh, I've compared the uh, platforms, uh, plank by plank, there's about 70 in each. Uh, the Republicans and Democrats agree about on, on about 25 of them, and we all love Oregon. We all think Oregon is a great place. We all believe in personal freedom, and we all oppose uh, government spying. Uh, those are the things that we agree on. Then there's about 20 or so that, that we really don't have a constituency in either one. They're sort of just on different subjects. And then, then there's about 30 that we really disagree strongly. And I would say that how I square it is the, the founders were, in, were supportive of people, the American people as they saw them, of the pioneers and, and better rights for people. I'd say the Republican platform these days supports business. Now, if you know, there weren't, corporations were considered very controlled and very limited at the time the founders, uh, the founders were putting the Constitution in place. Now, unfortunately, it seems that the Republican platform supports businesses as corporate, as people, over people as people. And so, well, you just have to look at the planks and compare them. There's some specific planks in the Republican platform that say mostly about supporting the, biz the rights of business, the rights to do business, et cetera, et cetera. And th that's all fine, but they don't have the equivalent rights for people. And if you read them both, you'll have to compare them. I mean, like, there's 70 planks. We don't have time to go through them. I'm feeling a little hesitant about answering this because it was a very general question, but I'll give it my best shot. You know, the founders talked about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And they talked about all people. They said all men, but I'd like to think they meant all people because they were using men as a generic term for human beings were created equal. And the Bill of Rights talks about things like protection from undue search and seizure and protection from and protection for free speech. All of these are things that I think are represented in the democratic platform. The specifics, you can argue. It's an ideological question about whether a specific plank supports those ideals better than another specific plank. And I don't think we really have time to get into that debate. But I firmly believe that the Oregon Democratic Party, the Democratic Party of Oregon, the platform definitely is congruent with some of the core principles in the US Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. Just a quick additional comment that uh, I don't quite ag agree with uh, the, the comparison. The, um, the, the difference between a Republican candidate and a Democrat candidate is we have more flexibility. We can I can disagree with certain positions of the Republican Party and still be a viable candidate on the Republican ticket. That's not the case with the Democrat Party. If you don't subscribe to that party's platform, then you are. 
This is called Opinion. This is called the television show ending. John Tyner, president of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum, a service of the forum. These discussions will continue after the, the camera goes off. You can see this on TVC channel 27. 21. 21, excuse me. And uh, basically we stream online, not contemporaneously, so I guess that's not really streaming, it's sort of like rivering. But in any event, um, questions will continue subject to moderator limitations and... We know the drill, don't we, Chris? Thank you for kind of tuning in, and we'll see you next week um, when we have the climate change. We have no program on the 10th. That's Veterans Day. On the 17th, Jim Moore, professor at Pacific University, will be here to give his inimical remarks on what forms the election took. Thank you very much. Chris Leslie, board member. This is where you can show your leadership. Which measure would you want us to vote for or against? And each one chooses a separate measure. We have the open primary, the uh, marijuana, the driver card, anything. I'll go first on this one. <laughs> um, this one's pretty easy for me. There are a lot of issues on the ballot, and you're going to have to make your decisions. But the two that I feel the most strongly about are Measure 90 which is the open primary, um, which I'm urging people to vote no on, and I'll explain in a second. And Measure 91, which is the marijuana one, which I actually have endorsed and I'm supporting, and I encourage people to vote yes. So, quick explanations of both. I agree that an increasing number of voters have been disenfranchised by the way we structure our primary system. So if we were to talk about a way to increase access to the primaries without having the top two piece of it, I would support that change if it was well structured. I don't support the top two piece of this. I think that will disenfranchise voters. I think it will make elections more expensive, and it'll mean that in a district like mine, you'll have two Democrats running against each other in November, and Mr. Verbeek wouldn't have a platform, and I don't think that's good for Senate District 17. So that's why I'm urging a no vote on 90. 91, you know, there's a core of me that's a libertarian which is to say I think that we regulate things. Um, we don't do what the Europeans call pragmatic harm reduction. Marijuana is less addictive than nicotine by orders of magnitude, and that's speaking as a physician. It's less addictive than alcohol. Um, it really should not be regulated and made illegal the way it is. We are much safer if we legalize it, regulate it, and tax it. Colorado's already seen a decrease in the number of 12 to 17 year olds using marijuana after legalization because they can't just buy it on the street corner anymore. That's what we should be doing to protect our kids. We'll have to figure out the DOE stuff, but we can do that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I vote no on uh, 91, the marijuana, not my kids. And 92, I think, is a very interesting ballot measure. That's about the labeling. At first, I was excited because I'm all for transparency and that you, that you pay what you, uh, what you get what you pay for. But the way it is written, and especially the part where it gives government agencies, agencies uh, uh, regulatory authority over enforcing those measures, this is, uh, I almost thought this is written, it could be written by Monsanto itself. They have the attorneys and the law and the deep pockets. They can deal with all these regulations. But the little farmer, that uh, they, they're going to go under if you have to pay $10,000 for each violation. So I think it's, uh, we have to do work on it, on labeling. But this measure, the way it is written, I urge you to vote no on it. Well, I guess the rules were that I was not supposed to take one of the issues that was already covered. Uh, so I won't uh, cover the GMO one, although uh, keep in mind it's genetically engineered, not genetically modified. Everybody gets that wrong. But the one that I would uh, emphasize the most that I think is very important for the future of Oregon is the measure on creating an endowment for colleges, sometimes called the Wheeler uh, Constitutional Amendment to allow bonding authority for the states to create a fund that they then can be used to support 
technical education as well as college edu post k post uh, k12 education and the reason why i think that's very important is people don't realize but the united but oregon is an educational institution we have a huge educational system all private universities and i went to a private university my brother went to a private university have big endowments and they manage them some of the people including my opponent in this district uh, say well we can't trust the state to manage these finances well the state is already managing finances already managing grants already managing gifts from alumni for a whole range of things. It is true they can get it wrong, but I think it's important to keep the debt down for our students. They, many students now have outrageous debts that they can't pay back or can't pay back with the jobs that they can get. So I think we need to improve the ability to, for the state to fund the people who need to go to school and get the training they need to live in the 21st century. Thank you. John Blackman, forum member. That would be a yes vote on that. I hear a lot about, we need funding for this, and we need funding for that. Can any of you or each of you name a new tax or an increased tax that you would be in favor of in view of the fact that the state of Oregon cannot print little pieces of paper and call them dollars. I'm not in favor of any more tax. I pay tax enough. My real estate tax bill is uh, humongous again this year. Uh, the, the key is an increased activity, increased economic activity that will raise the income tax receipts. That's the way uh, to go forward. Uh, be careful with how we regulate uh, our economy and to make, make it possible for businesses to succeed. Oregon's tax structure is a mess. We don't have a sustainable system. The combination of being based largely on income tax, the effects of measures 5 and 50 with property tax limitation, the fact that we have no sales tax, all of these things combined means that we don't have a stable tax base. That does not mean I know exactly how we should fix it or exactly what I would vote yes on because I'm not going to commit to voting yes on any tax change until I really see the data. I will say that in 2013, when Senator Hass and Senator Reed, in whose district, I, Representative Reed, in whose district I think we are right now, were proposing a, what they called a five and five which is to say drop our top income tax rate to 5% and implement a 5% sales tax on non-essential goods, which is to say not food, not medication, not the things everybody has to buy, but the discretionary items, that they had good data that showed that we could keep most Oregonians' taxes just about the same, drop them for some people, decrease them for some people, and still bring in $800 million a year more because we'd catch the cash economy and we'd catch the tourists. When I go back to Massachusetts to visit my family, I pay tax there. And when my mom comes to visit me, she doesn't. I think we need to be making sure everybody's contributing to this great state. So exactly what I'd vote yes on, I'm not gonna commit without seeing a firm proposal. I do think we need to look very hard at our tax system in Oregon. I'll just pretty much echo uh, what the senator said. Uh, we, have, we don't have enough money to go around. One of the big sources of money that comes from people who aren't living here that doesn't come out of our pockets is from a, a well-structured sales tax, but it has to be tied in with modifications to a more stable tax structure overall. I would also support limitations on the kicker so that we get more money from that and more stability, particularly for educational funding. And I would point out the 254 cities in the state have said that they suggest a five cent gas tax or a tax on miles driven. And so those are things that, again, I'll echo what she said, is that I wouldn't vote, I'm not saying I vote yes on a particular proposal, but I would look at all those as being options for generating more revenue. I was at a recent forum in Clackamas County where all the social agencies said what we really don't have is enough resources, so we can't generate, we can't print money, so we have to find some way for more resources, or we have to say we're going to have kids living in tents out in the, fo out in the forest, or we're going to have people who have, have homeless problems, they can't find homes, or drug addicts who can't get treatment, or people who have mental disabilities who can't get some assistance for that, for home care, which is a lot cheaper. At any rate, that's my response. 
I'm Lee Coleman, a forum member. Uh, and my friend Lois O'Brien asked a particularly important question that is largely ignored. Uh, which political party's platform uh, conforms more to the intent of the founders of this country? Uh, that expression was made in the preamble to the Constitution in which the mission statement for the government is, thou shalt provide justice, provide for the general welfare, and assure domestic tranquility. And by domestic tranquility, I, I believe that includes keeping people happy enough so they don't riot in the streets. So which party does comport more with the Constitution? and the intent of the founders. Uh, Republicans and Democrats are free to comment. I'm really, I'm really not trying to be disrespectful, Mr. Coleman. I, I guess I'm going to stick with the answer I gave before. I think it depends on your interpretation. And I think if you read the founders' writings that surrounded the time when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, which I have read, and recently, as well as in college, um, I think they're open to interpretation, just as we know that people have different interpretations of holy scriptures, they have different interpretations of all sorts of documents. Um, we run into this with statute in Oregon, people interpret them differently. So I really think that both parties are trying to hew to the core principles of the Constitution and the intent of the founders interpretations may vary and perspectives on how we achieve those goals may vary. I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I don't think that there's a clear answer to it from my perspective. Yeah, you've, you have to be careful with platforms. The platform isn't running for office, the candidates are. And what, what does the candidate do for justice? I don't think uh, we can make more progress with justice in the US. There's a lot of hypocrisy. And uh, not everybody has equal access. Uh, some people are able to sue, but not everybody has the ability. And the role of the government is to protect the weak from the strong. And so which candidate uh, is ruthless trying to implement that? And uh, it's very important and that we don't uh, continue to increase the divide between the, the, the strong and the weak. Well, we can go a little bit too long. It looks like we're actually getting to the point where we've lost a bunch of the audience. Let me suggest that, um, that we might be looking at an ink blot test. You see what you want to in it. So with that, Lois, you, you have a question different? It's a real short question. Okay. Can it be yes or no? Are yes, looking? it can be yes or no. We'll do a yes or no yes question or no. now. <laughs> okay, uh, about the, uh, the interpretation of the Constitution and the Declaration, uh, that is why the writers and the people working on this wrote the Federalist Papers. How many, who has read the Federalist Papers and who has not? It's a yes or a no. <laughs> when? That's actually two questions. <laughs> You're cut off, actually, I answered that one in my previous response, both in college and recently, relatively recently. No. <laughs> well, I like Federalist 21 especially. Okay, this is it. We're, we're done, and I'm going to thank um, Carter Cruz for being our timekeeper. You're... Yay. Your baptism by fire, you did very well. Thank you very much. And I want to thank John McWilliams for putting the forum to, uh, program together today and his work with the forum, um, uh, whatever it is we do, all year. So I think it was called a programming committee. Thank you. Um, Eric Squires, Joseph Tyner, thank you very much. And thank you for coming. And candidates, I, this is part of the um, baptism of fire. Thank you for being here. And thank you all for coming. Bye-bye now.